What's up, sons? It's Blind Rod with Samba Tech once again, and today we're going to be talking about is it possible to DDoS a mining pool, specifically Ethermine. Now, this idea comes from a, kind of a hit piece, to be honest, on cryptocurrency miners, specifically Ethereum miners, from a website called Trust Nodes. Now, they did some cherry picking on the Bitsby Trippin video covering EIP 1559, as well as the whole miners mining to Ethermine and coordinating that on April 1st, which was a tweet posted by Red Panda Mining a little bit further back than this. Now, one of the things they mentioned is one of the first lines of defense, in their opinion, would be essentially to DDoS Ethermine in the event that miners start getting close to 51% on Ethermine.org. And today I have joining me DP Unique, who did the lion's share of the mining pools for Son of Attack from 2016 to 2018. And we are going to discuss this right after a word from our sponsor. The following is a paid advertisement. Prime XBT is an established trading platform that was founded in 2018 and remained in business through the bear market. For my personal research, there are three main reasons they set themselves apart from other trading platforms. High leverage, low fees, and most importantly, privacy. Prime XBT requires no user information to start trading. The newest module called Covesting allows users to copy the trading activity of other users. Remember, any form of investing comes with significant risks, so do your own research. Use promo code SONOFATECH at sign up for a 50% bonus. All right, welcome back, and Dane, welcome. And I hope you can go ahead and give us some insight here. You've already read the article, and one of the big notes that we wanted to talk about is that they reference a mining pool called Ghash. And Ghash has essentially had a DDoS attack against them back in 2014, uh, basically when they were getting closer and closer to 51% attack. Now there's a couple misconceptions here. One is that it actually stopped any sort of mining. And the other one is that it was actually a DDoS attack to prevent it from getting to 51% attack. Now reviewing uh, the archives from Reddit as well as the archives uh, from their response, it didn't appear that it did anything more than take down the front end. So to explain that to us, uh, basically, Dane, can you go over essentially what would actually need to be done from a DDoS perspective to stop mining? Uh, yeah, so if we're talking about stopping mining specifically, uh, your cryptocurrency pools are typically divided up into several layers. Uh, you've got the front end, as you discussed with Ghash, uh, You've got the stratum, which is where your miners connect uh, to to talk to, you know, get the work. And then that stratum talks back to the coin node to actually get, you know, information, transactions, and do the actual get work RPC commands from the coin node itself. Uh, so if you're talking about DDoSing and trying to prevent mining, you have to try and place a focus on taking down the stratum itself or the coin node. Uh, both of those are kind of very unlikely in the fact that one, your coin node's never really exposed to anything other than the stratum. It doesn't have any public ports open. You don't have any way to access it. And most people on the outside that don't have internal information to Ethermine aren't going to have the IP address to even know where that coin node lives. Uh, apart from that, you've got the stratum, which again, it can sit behind a reverse proxy. It can sit behind a web application firewall. Uh, or it can you know sit behind anything that has some sort of DDoS protection, including the DNS level uh, with something like Cloudflare, Newstar. These DNS providers provide you know native DDoS protection. Uh, so there's several layers there in between that. Um, and again, if they're using a reverse proxy, you're also hiding the IP address of the actual Stratum server, so you won't be able to hit it with requests directly. Uh, so you know, like Ghash, my most likely outcome here is that people try to DDoS by attacking the IP that they can find, which ends up just being a web server. And maybe potentially they take down the web server uh, for some regions throughout the day. Uh, but mining itself, I expect to remain online. Yeah, and they would never really be able to stop mining because at that point, the miners are still connected to the node. It's not like they need the, the front end to communicate with the servers providing the service for the mining pools. 
And as you guys can see, they have multiple regions covered for Ethermine, and presumably they have failovers as well in place of some sort, I would assume, to where the miners could fail over to a different server. So you'd have to take out, at this point, at, at least four different regions with at least two known different connections within North America alone. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, most Stratum servers, if you look at the open source tech that's out there, um, and we're basing it off what we know about those, uh, they usually have the ability to support more than one uh, coin node as well as one, more than one uh, Stratum. You can set up Stratums in high availability uh, because what they do is all the information they have from the workers, from the coin node is actually temporarily stored in like a high performance database like Redis, which is an in-memory database. Everything gets stored there so that uh, if one of the stratums goes down, it just fails right over to the other one. And all the information they need to know who submitted how many shares is already stored in that Redis database. Uh, so, you know, again, that's yet another layer you would have to take down completely to stop mining is, is the primary and secondary stratums. And then, you know, potentially another region uh, because I can technically mine to the European servers. It's just going to be a lot less performant, but I won't be down and, and losing total profits and ether mine won't be, uh, losing a ton of traffic. All right, cool. Thanks for the clarification. It's something I wanted to clear up because this seems like a lot of FUD getting thrown around about, you know, being able to even perform an attack like this. Basically, if you're going to be mining to Ethermine and you see the front end go down, don't worry, go ahead and check your miner itself and make sure that it's receiving shares from the mining pool and then you're, you're good to go. Now, I did want to ask, is it possible to maybe DDoS through API requests or calls and overload the server in some form or fashion there like we know to get the miners information and how many shares and what their estimated payout and revenue is, the pool is talking to the nodes essentially and pulling that information, correct? So could you maybe find an attack vector there? Uh, yeah, and, th and that part uh, I'll say is highly dependent on what level of customization that Ethermine has done to their APIs. Um, you know, some of the larger pools, what I've seen them do is they'll take, you know, typically the API is hosted with the stratum on some of the open source solutions. Uh, so in that case, you are talking directly to that stratum and you could try and send a ton of HTTP requests and, and take that API down. Uh, but larger pools, typically one, they'll cache. Uh, so they have another layer of API in front of that with some backend uh, language like PHP or uh, C Sharp or uh, Go or, or Node.js. And what they're doing is they're storing the responses from the stratum somewhere local to the web server so that way, if the API goes down or the stratum goes down, all that information is still there. Uh, but also, if you try to hit the API, you're actually hitting that layer in front of the stratum and not directly affecting uh, the, the stratum that's being served by the API uh, or the API that's being served by the stratum server. Uh, so, you know, they could be doing that. They could also have written their own API that pulls the stats straight out of Redis, which, again, if they have that in a highly available uh, set up, you can hit that and it's all in memory. So the responses are real easy for that thing to handle a couple hundred thousand requests. Uh, you know, my, my hunch there is someone like Ethermine definitely has a secondary API layer that's got some sort of caching or something uh, so that you're not, you know, exceeding the rate limits of whatever web server they have hosting the stratum information. Right. Newer pools that I have seen that have had to resolve this uh, recently would have been Hive on. I know that they had their basically something go wrong. I guess I don't know if it was with Redis or what, but the minor information wasn't being displayed properly. So on a maybe on a a newer pool or a less experienced pool. Maybe that would be a possibility, uh, but at the same time, it seems to just have the same effect as taking down the front end at the end of the day. Um, I think the miners would still, it'd be safe to say that the miners would still be able to stay connected and receive shares and perform work. Definitely, yeah. So that, that's something I forgot to mention uh, when I was talking about it a second ago is typically uh, your API is served by something like Golang, uh, Rust, or a C++ server that's running separately from the uh, the actual stratum itself. The stratum is running on one port through uh, you know some language, and then typically a separate service is running that hosts that API. Uh, so even if you do successfully take down the API, in theory, if it's configured that way, their stratum remains online, you can still send and submit shares. Uh, the API just might make the website fall behind a few minutes if it's unavailable while they use some cache results. So your hash rate may not be the most current. 
Got it. Cool. So yeah, I just wanted to do this video with you to basically be able to educate everybody else within the community on kind of this, this idea of basically uh, hitting a pool and trying to DDoS it and what would have to go into it. I don't think that it's necessarily something that could be done. Uh, even if you are as smart as say, like, I don't know the developers of Ethereum either, either, now they have different tools that could prevent this. And I'm pretty sure uh, that they have plans to prevent this with different tools, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, the miners are communicating with the chain. And so that's where I would see the line of defense being. But what I wanted to do was clear up these misconceptions and this kind of this uh, basically just I guess poorly written and researched articles so that the community is aware of like how this stuff functions because I feel like a lot of people that are just investing in Ethereum and even some minor and even miners themselves, you know, don't necessarily have all of the information to properly uh, speak on it intelligently. So thanks yeah. for coming on and, and definitely going over that. As far as trustnodes.com, I would not trust trustnodes.com for. Uh, relevant cryptocurrency information, seeing that uh, this is their understanding of it. Especially if you do any sort of digging, you can see essentially that the Ghash pool still was sending shares back according to the Reddit archive from that time. And if you look at Ghash's response letter, uh, they noted that they had actually received a bounty a request from the DDoSer who was saying, give me five to 10 BTC and I'll make it stop. They also at that time had done that to an exchange as well. So these DDoS attacks do not appear to be confirmed as a prevention uh, against a 51% attack or a, a pool obtaining 51%. Yeah. yeah. And if we're, yeah, we're talking about the validity of this article, right. And, and, you know, one thing we brought up is that that G hash attack is back from 2014. Uh, you know, talking seven years ago, the advancements in technology since then, right? Not even just talking about the fact that the stratum and the reverse proxy software has ways to protect against DDoS. Naturally, uh, you've got a lot more in the way of stuff like web application firewalls and rules inside of your VPS servers and stuff like that. If Ethermine's using that, I'm sure they have their own data center, but in most cases, you know, you have other layers of technology that are purpose built to prevent DDoS attempts and they have algorithms that know what valid traffic looks like as opposed to what invalid traffic looks like. And so the moment you start sending that, it'll probably take a few seconds, but I would expect that the uh, servers they have serving out this traffic will kill uh, your connections pretty quickly. Um, and apart from, you know, basically that leaves the only opportunity is to send valid traffic to the network. I was um, going to ask about that. Yeah. Yep, which that, that creates two problems. Uh, one, if you're going to try and attack us by sending valid hash rate uh, to Ethermine, you're probably leaning more in towards helping us get to the 51% uh, than you are helping us DDoS that. Now, be careful using the term us because we are referring to basically this, this I guess, this movement that, that was started by Red Panda Mining and then explained in more depth by Bitsby Trippin. Um, and I want to be careful on that and make sure that we are reporting on this um, as uh, unbiased as possible, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and by us, I just mean, you know, I'm part of the mining community that that's been right. my main source. So I'm saying, you know, in in people participating in that, you know, a tech demonstration of saying, can we actually move enough hash rate over there to demonstrate, you know, our concerns with EIP uh, uh, or at least my concerns with EIP? Uh, in a technical demonstration way. So when I say that, that's all I'm referring to. Right. Well, and then we also need to clarify the the misconceptions on what miners are trying to do and why they're trying to do it. This is not about being upset about losing money necessarily from burned fees. Miners will shift and move to other coins. The scare is, and the potential is, that ETH becomes less profitable than other mineable coins by GPUs and enough hash rate drops off a cliff when London and 1559 are put into place that 
a 51% attack could be coordinated on the Ethereum network. And so that is the actual concern for miners. Now, what I have read is that essentially from the devs, they've said, at least in tweets, with no real, I guess, meat or backing behind it, because we have been requesting that, or no studies or models behind it, that Ethereum could drop 80% of its hash rate and still be secure. Now, that doesn't actually coincide or add up when you start taking a look at the models that Bits be Trippin has put into place. And you can tell that Bits is primarily concerned about the security of Ethereum. He has always been an Ethereum fanboy. Um, it's not me so much, uh, not near as much to his level. So he, he has a lot uh, staked within Ethereum. So I wanted to clarify that that's not, the intention is not to perform a 51% attack and the intent and the reasoning for this is not necessarily because of profit. Of course, they are correlated, but you can't expect somebody to provide you security at your bar if the bar next door offers more money for the same security. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I think it gets back to another point of in most uh, technology nowadays, you know, nothing goes into production without first going through a testing phase. Uh, and one of the issues that comes around this when we're talking about EIP 1559 is it's something that everybody's built models around, but there's no real way to predict what's going to happen uh, until it's actually put in place. We see what how the profits are affected. We see what miners decide to do, uh, whether they drop off, whether they just move to another coin, whether they put everything up on NiceHash. Um, and, and we haven't really received, like you said, we've been asking for, but we haven't really received any studies or research or, or hard documentation from the Ethereum team that says, here's why we can drop 80% and still be okay. Uh, all we really have to go off of as miners is the information that content creators like Bits be tripping to put out there and put a lot of work into generating and, and why his estimations are the way they are. Uh, so as far as doing some sort of testing phase, I think this is the best that miners can come up with to do is to say, hey, um, let's, before EIP goes in, see how much of our hash rate we can actually move uh, to take a look and see you know, do we hit 40%? Do we hit 50% of the network? Um, and that's just trying to do a test. It's not trying to do a 51% a attack, like you said. You know, I don't think anybody has ill intent here. I think it's specifically uh, just following the trend you typically see in, in the tech world is before something goes into production, you do some sort of test. And I think this is the best people can come up with uh, based on not having all the information that the Ethereum devs have and, and only having what we've been able to build as a community or people on YouTube content creators have been able to put out there. Right. And that's one thing. They could know a lot of stuff that we don't know and everything will be fine and everything will move forward. And hey, maybe MEV will be good enough to compensate for the profits and more people will stay mining ETH. These are all possibilities. Um, I, I did want to mention that I, I'm kind of... I, I struggle with the fact that I don't think because of the nature of the influencers and the type of people that, that wa watch most of our content, including Bits, Red Panda, myself, even Vosk, are necessarily running large enough farms or even ASICs to maybe make an impact necessarily. And so I'm actually quite curious on how much hash will actually get moved over. So from a, I guess from a curiosity standpoint, I'm kind of excited to see exactly how much hash rate is really flowing from home GPU miners versus, and basically primarily US based miners too, to be frank as opposed to uh, what is in production from, say, someone like InnoSilicon with the uh, Ethereum ASIC miners that are currently most likely in a lot more uh, production than I think we are aware of at this point, especially if you look at how much the hash rate of the only pool that supported EIP-1559 has grown over the past few weeks. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's another benefit that comes out of this type of demonstration or tech test, right, is uh, we see what the level of centralization actually looks like. You know, uh, maybe it's massively centralized to to YouTube content creators and to the viewers that watch there, right? Somehow we hit the 51% or it hits 60% while they're doing this demonstration. Uh, you know, that would actually be amazing. But I tend to hedge my bets where you are. I think uh, the farms that are overseas in different countries and, and you know, running ASICs and a combination of GPU farms, 
I, I have a high feeling that maybe we'll get to 40% if that. Uh, I think 40% would still be considered a success just based on the fact that if 40% or if the same percentage moves over to Ethermine and the rest drop off or that same amount put everything over to NiceHash, there's more opportunity to create uh, you know, the thing we're trying to prevent here, which is actually a 51% attack uh, on the Ethereum network. So I, I can I can see there's a lot of benefits coming out of this. And so articles like this that come out and try to dismiss it as, you know, people having ill intent or, you know, just quoting certain lines out of context from content creators, I think speaks for itself. And and really, I just think this is the best bet we we can see somebody demonstrate with a tech test of, okay, what does centralization look like? How much hash power is actually floating around that that could go up for grabs? Uh, and we just kind of have to wait and see what that looks like at the end of this. Yeah, and maybe it just exposes that it is already currently centralized, right? Um, hash power wise, maybe it does expose that, you know, and that would be interesting too. It's gonna, it, it, it definitely is playing, it's interesting how much um, it is playing a role in the Ethereum price versus the Bitcoin price. We recently had that big jump in Bitcoin price up to like 56,000. It doesn't look like Ethereum is staying at scale with it. And I don't know if that's FUD over the miners or if that is other outside aspects. My, my initial thoughts with the amount of support the devs had for EIP 1559 and from general retail investors support, I my assumption was it was going to go up in price uh, at a greater rate than 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 Bitcoin, and it hasn't. So uh, there does seem to be a little bit of um, a, a little bit of cautiousness surrounding investing in Ethereum right now, which is kind of odd. Um, if if it is true that 1559 makes ethereum deflationary and increases the price outside of miners it would in theory uh make everybody else i guess richer right like all the investors it would be good for them so it's kind of odd i'm kind of curious on what's going on with the public perception maybe comments you guys can let me know uh, if it is primarily everything surrounding what's going on between the miners right now and the devs as well as just the general population and the general population's perspective on ETH. I mean, a few months ago when we started talking about EIP 1559, I had already mentioned that you know I wasn't too confident in holding a lot of ETH, especially seeing the lack of growth compared to Bitcoin. Uh, since September when the bull market started happening again. And if you compared it to the bull market back in 2017 to 2018, it just wasn't growing as fast as it was back then, right, in relation to it. So it kind of threw up some red flags for me uh, as far as from an investment standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. But... We're going to go, guys. I hope this video was insightful. And thank you, Dane, for being here. You guys can hit up DP Unique in my Rocket Chat by clicking that Join button down below. And he can answer any questions on mining pools that he knows and then do some research, I suppose, as well, if not. And do you have a blog or anything you'd like to shout out? Uh, yeah, I've got a blog. It's, it's kind of out of date. I'm um, fixing to post some more stuff up there soon, but it's uh, onsb.co. So onsb.co stands for Oh No Shit Broke. Uh, it's just a place where I kind of put some articles up on PowerShell and, and some of the day-to-day -day IT stuff that we come across that can be automated and stuff like that. So uh, if you want to visit the site or if you just want to hit me up in the Rocket Chat, I'm more than glad to, to talk tech with you guys and especially around the pools if there's any questions you guys have on how stratums work and uh, how the mining back end looks. I know there's tons of videos that talk about pools and, and what they're doing as far as shares and stuff. But if you have a little bit more tech questions, you know, feel free to hit me up and I'll be glad to research or answer anything I can on what I already know. So definitely join the Rocket Chat. We've got a lot of people in there asking a lot of great questions. So uh, let's keep the conversation going there. Cool. I'll leave a link to uh, your blog down in the description. And you guys know how to find us on Rocket Chat. So we'll see you next Tuesday. If you enjoyed this content, you can check out more crypto content on this playlist up here. Or, of course, go ahead and subscribe for more in the future. Adios.